Hi, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World, and um, it's a Friday night, so I'm not going to sit on the computer for too long. But um, anyway, I was thinking about something that uh, kind of kind of hit me. Um, uh, I was thinking about Myron Roll. Myron Roll used to play for the uh, Florida State Seminoles, and he was a great athlete and an even better student. He was actually a Rhodes Scholar. And uh, there were people in the NFL that questioned his uh, loyalty to football because he seemed like he wanted to actually learn and study and get educated. Now, of course, you know me. I'm, I, I mean, I was extremely proud of Myron and um, and everything he brought to the table. Um, you know, I, I think the only thing better than than a brilliant, hardworking athlete is a brilliant, hardworking, conscientious athlete. And that's where I put guys like Latan Thomas and, and a couple others who, um, you know, not only understand that athletic ability is really a stepping stone to a more meaningful life, but they also realize that uh, that, you know, as an athlete, your goal is not just to be good at one thing. Your goal is to be good at everything. I mean, that's that should be your value system, right? Your value system should say that I'm going to work my hardest, whether I'm on the field, in the classroom or anything else. And then the other really important part of that, in my opinion, is that you want to say, not only am I going to work hard at everything I do and become excellent at everything I do and become outstanding, make money, bling ball, whatever it is you want to do, but you're going to also do use that to elevate the people that you love. Just like a man takes care of his family, well, I think black men should also take care of our community. So, you know, with that being said, um, you know, I, I saw that Myron is on his way to becoming a neurosurgeon now, which which doesn't surprise me and makes me very proud of him as well. I think he's going to be better off in the long term. Uh, he's doing a job that's going to actually stimulate his brain, allow him to have the ability to, uh, to fix the brains of other people as opposed to playing football, which we know is linked to lots of brain damage. Um, there's nothing natural about crack Crashing your head into other 300 pound men, uh, you know, over and over and over again for a number of years. I mean, your brain is not, your brain is soft. It's not, you know, it's not like a piece of metal. It's, it's something where if you're hitting it over and over again, it's going to get bruised just like your, your legs and your ankles or anything else. Imagine somebody who's punching you in the kidney over and over again or punching you in the heart over and over or punching you in your arm over and over. It's going to get bruised. It's going to get injured. Well, your brain's the same way. Even though you have the skull to protect you, that brain is getting rattled around when football players are slamming into each other. So I'm not a big fan of football. You know, that's one area where President Obama and I agree in lockstep is that um, you know, I don't think that we should encourage our boys to go play football. Now, of course, they're going to always want to do that. I mean, when I was a kid, I loved football, too. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong necessarily with playing the sport or choosing the sport. But I do think that we can really sort of think about, OK, why is it that our boys gravitate towards sports as their pathway to success? Um, well, you know, what is it that they want? Do they want to play the game just because they love the game or do they play the game because they think that, getting better at the game is going to give them other things like maybe a chance to have a better life have some money have some women have some status imagine if you took all that away imagine if playing football meant you were a nerd you didn't get any money you didn't get any the women didn't like you you had no status because people didn't respect you would guys still play football um i don't know i mean sometimes some guys would i mean i loved the sport when i was a kid but I would say that, uh, you know, a lot of the things that young men, you know, play sports for are things they can get in other ways. So my point here is that um, when I started doing the, the math when I was a kid, first of all, I just saw how hard it was to make it to the NFL, the NBA. I realized in high school I didn't have the talent. A lot of guys figured that out about that time. Um, no matter how hard you work, sometimes you just don't have it. And um, and then I also, as I got older, I saw guys who actually did live the dream, who went to college, did well as athletes. I'm talking about played for you know Ohio State and Tennessee and Kentucky and were superstars and had a chance to play professional sports. Well, the side of the equation they don't tell you about is that that many of these athletes don't make as much money as people think. Uh, also, their careers are very, very, very short. So a lot of them um, end up broke. Uh, they end up embracing a lifestyle that's really expensive. You know, like it's expensive to go to the club and throw hundred dollar bills in the air and and buy three hundred dollar bottles of Cristal or whatever. Like, like that's sh that shit's expensive. Excuse my French. And then on top of that. Um, you know, just the lifestyle, like, okay, I now, I, all my hard work is paying off. I'm 22. I've got, you know, $800,000 in the bank. So I'm going to go buy me a Mercedes. I'm going to buy me a big house. I'm going to, you know, buy the nicest clothes. I'm going to just, I'm going to buy my mama a house. I'm going to buy stuff for all my cousins. I'm going to hire my relatives and friends who can't really do anything for me. So ultimately that money just gets eaten up and drained away. And the unfortunate reality is that 
when you're young, sometimes you just think you're never going to get old. You think your body's going to last forever as long as you work hard and you practice and you're always going to be the man. And then that stuff creeps up on you. And then suddenly your athletic career is over far sooner than you expected it to be. And you end up looking pretty pathetic because, you know, unfortunately for many athletes, they have leveraged everything in order to play a sport. They didn't learn how to, you know, they didn't learn anything in school because, you know, the schools were passing them through uh, without pushing them to do anything. Even I remember being um, at universities where I saw some egregious, egregious academic violations occur um, that resulted in keeping athletes on the court or on the field who didn't belong there, who could not read, uh, who clearly weren't passing their classes. But, you know, these universities get bought out by money. And basically, when you got $20 million on the line, you don't want to be that professor who says, you know, so-and-so shouldn't be playing in the championship game. Um, now, mind you, you know me, I wouldn't have cared. In fact, I, I got into a big fight with a um, football coach at Syracuse because he kept taking my the quarterback out of my class, and I was really angry about that. Um, but that's beside the point. Uh, so going deeper into this, my point here is that – we have to really think about the trade-off in terms of sports. I mean, sometimes I think that the athletic ability of the black male, the extreme athletic ability that we have, can be as much of a curse as it is a blessing. Because in a way, you see so many men uh, putting everything into playing sports, it, it, and they sort of forsake everything else in order to get there. And then when they find out that the avenue they've chosen doesn't work out, they don't have anything to fall back on. And not only does it hurt them, it hurts the children they created. You know, remember when you get when you get all these women that are wanting to sleep with you, babies come out of that, and babies' mamas come out of that, and babies' mamas are expensive. Child support is the quickest way to go broke. If you really want to go broke, go get about three babies' mamas, and they watch watch, watch that shit just eat through your money like Pac Man. That's just real. Um, you know, and, and then on top of that, though, when you have children, you have an obligation to be a good father to those children. And part of that obligation includes being a good provider. Well, if you don't have an education and you don't have skills and you can't get a job and you can't create a business, how are you going to really provide? I mean, how are you going to do that? You know, especially if you have leveraged your whole entire existence on dribbling a basketball or throwing a football. I mean, that's just sad. I mean, it's scary. It's, it's very, very sad to see. A guy who used to be the man, who's used to all the attention, who's practically spoiled because he's used to people just giving him whatever he wanted, being nice to him for whatever reason, women giving him whatever he wanted. And then seeing that guy, uh, you know, going from one tryout to the next, begging for a job, hoping that somebody picks him up, it becomes kind of sad. And so what I would argue is that if you want to play sports, that's fine. Just make sure that your athletic energy is part of a comprehensive package where you just say, look, I'm going to be the best at everything I do. Sports. I'm gonna be the best academically. I'm gonna be the best in terms of life. You know, when it comes to being a father, I'm gonna be the best father ever. When it comes to just being a person, an activist, a human being, when it comes to my community, I'm gonna be the best asset I can be to my community. And the thing that I think we have to really be honest with about when it comes to young black men is we have to tell them you can't be an asset to your community if you're you're high and drunk all the time. If you formed addictions to drugs and alcohol. But guess what? Society acts like it's no big deal. They tell you, oh, pick up the bottle, man. You know, go drink that Chirac. Go smoke this weed. Go hit, you know, the harder drugs or whatever. Rappers will tell you, but to do it all day, uh, society doesn't take it seriously. But then you have all these tragedies that come out of substance abuse. You have so many brothers that are alcoholics. I mean, so many families are destroyed every year by black men who become alcoholics and can't be there for their kids. So many families are destroyed by drugs. I don't want to get, in, get into just what drugs have done to the black community. We're the ones who get hooked on the drugs. We're the ones who get incarcerated by the drugs. We're the ones who get killed in drug-related violence. We're the ones who's, who get a, whose kids get abandoned uh, due to drugs. I mean, it's like drugs are just like the worst thing that ever happened in the black community. So if I were king for a day, I would just make a law that says, look, no drugs, no alcohol for anybody. That's that's one area where I'm in lockstep with, with Islamic culture, you know, in terms of how they perceive drugs and alcohol. I think they have it right on point that these things are just poison to your society. Um, again, I'm not knocking anybody who chooses to drink, but that's the reason I chose not to drink because that gives me one less thing to worry about amongst all the other things that can get me killed as a black man. I know I don't have to worry about necessarily getting shot up in the club because I was out popping bottles and, and whatever, popping mollies, whatever it is that people do. Um, you know, so uh, if you go deeper into that, I mean, you could also talk about some of the other 
trappings of eth- quote unquote athletic baller culture, like just you know in terms of womanizing, you know, sleeping with lots and lots of women in an irresponsible way. Um, I think that that kind of thinking is what feeds into the STD epidemic in the black community, because you've got a lot of men. Black men are already marginalized. Black men are already uh, we already don't have jobs like everybody else. Um, we many of us just don't go to the doctor just because. Um, many black men go to prison more than anybody else, which is where some of the most egregious human rights violations take place. And as a result, uh, you got a lot of unhealthy men who are sleeping with a whole lot of women. And the women are asking questions. The men are asking questions because everybody's looking good. Everybody's trying to get it popping. And as a result, you have sort of a, what I would call a quiet storm, you know, kind of developing behind the scenes. Because black people don't really talk about sex, so we're not talking about, you know, when people are getting infected with HIV or getting infected with herpes, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, all these other things. They don't talk about that. It just happens, and then everybody sort of quietly goes about their business, especially that church girl who sits in the front row who doesn't want anybody to think that she's a slut because she slept with a few guys, and one of them happened to give her a couple of STDs. So what I would say, going back to my point here, my point here is that when you're talking about your kids about being an athlete, about athletic culture about living a good intelligent um, life a productive life I think it's very important to make sure that you talk about all of that that you talk about you know number one starting number one you really don't have to be an athlete in order to make money in fact the people who make the most money in our society are not the athletes they're the people who own the athletes. They're the team owners. They're the, the agents for the athletes, the lawyers for the athletes, the, the, the doctors for the athletes. I mean, these are the people who have the long-term sustainable careers. My role by being a neurosurgeon is going to make money for 40 years. And you can't play football for 40 years. It's not possible. And they're not going to hire your ass as a coach. I mean, we know that. We know that they don't. there aren't that many slots available, and they don't hire black coaches, in, in, in at least not at the college level. I mean, in, in the NFL, they're doing a little bit better, but you're talking about, what, maybe four or five people out of thousands and thousands of people that would love to be a coach. So, you know, I would say that if you if you want your son to be successful, if you want him to have a chance at having just, you know, the most empowered life, I would suggest a couple of things. Number one, you got to make sure he understands that no matter what he does in life, you have to have education. If you're not educated, then you will get fucked. Excuse my French. The world, the world will fuck you. Now, I'm sorry, I know you don't like hearing Dr. Boyce cuss, or maybe you're not used to it, but I don't care. So I cuss, and it just happens. I don't think it takes it takes away or adds value to anything. It's just my form of expression. But I'm just telling you that if you're not educated, if you're an athlete, you can be the biggest baller on earth, have all the money in the world. But if you're not educated, somebody will walk up behind you and take your money. If you don't, if you aren't the superstar athlete, which is most of us, then you're going to find yourself always a day late, a dollar short, a step behind. I mean, it's that's just real. Um, so education has to be a part of any life plan, no matter what it is. And, but then more deeply, there has to be a sense of value system attached, you know, an understanding and, and, you know, an intelligent reflection on the impact of drugs and alcohol. You know, getting, you know, turning up the bottle every time, every weekend and drinking until you throw up is not a productive way for a man to live because it may seem cool when he's 22 years old in college doing that. But I mean, it's not cool 15 years later when he's an alcoholic and his kids don't even want to talk to him anymore. You know, so so I think a value system in terms of, you know, thinking, respecting your life, respecting your body, making intelligent decisions uh, when, it's, when it comes to dealing with women. I'm not a person who barks at people and preaches about getting everybody should get married and all this stuff. That's up to the individual. But I am one to say that there's nothing ever good comes from a man who sleeps with everything that moves. Uh, it, it just creates headaches. It creates um, you know, unnecessary stress in your life. You're always worried about whether or not you have a disease and, or if you're infecting somebody else. And then on top of that, you got to worry about unwanted pregnancies and uh, child support and all the things that come with that. And then really you got to ask yourself, like, am I doing this because this is something I really want to do? Or am I doing this because I kind of feel like, okay, as a man, as the man, as the man that all the girls want, it's my job to just sleep with all of them. So I can just brag about it or I can feel better as a man. Um, I don't think, I mean, I think you got to think about what you want out of life, not what everybody's telling you to want. Um, I think, you know, even more deeply, um, you know, when it comes to making money, I would just make sure your sons understand that there are lots of ways to make money that go outside of sports. And, and there are ways to make more money than what you do in sports. So, 
Uh, in fact, the best thing that ever happened to me was when I found out I wasn't good enough to be a professional athlete. Then I was looking for other alternatives. Sometimes necessity is the mother of invention. And I can give you a great example of a story that I saw, and, I, and then I'll end it at that. Um, there's a guy, and you might have seen, if you if you follow us at financialjuneteenth.com, um, you might have seen the story. There's a guy at Facebook, uh, who, who uh, his name, I can't remember the guy's name, uh, Brian Acton. And Brian went and he, he wanted a job really bad at Facebook or Twitter, and he applied for the jobs and they didn't hire him. I'm sure he also applied at Google. Well, he then realized that he had to go to plan B. He couldn't get plan A, his dream job of working at Facebook, so he had to go to plan B, which was to start his own company. Well, Brian went off, started WhatsApp, and literally four and a half years later, WhatsApp grew to a company that he sold to Facebook for $16 billion. Sixteen bill, that's a buck, billion dollars. Now compare that to what he would have gotten if he'd worked at Facebook or some other company. He might have made a few hundred thousand dollars, maybe a couple million, if he's lucky. Because those companies grew really fast, and those, those are great jobs to have. But it doesn't compare to the money that he has now. I mean, he literally has made enough money in one transaction to take care of his great, 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 great grandchildren, as well as pretty much all extended relatives going out to about the closest 300 people in his life. He can make them all millionaires, maybe more. So my point here is that, you know, sometimes you, not getting what you want can be the best thing for you. Um, I suggest that when you're thinking about pushing, you know, letting your son kind of be shoved through this, this mill, this you know, commodification of the black male through athletics, um, give, give them alternatives, you know, it, it, at the very least, when it comes to sports, why does everybody have to play basketball and football? Let them play baseball, tennis, soccer, golf, you know, something else. Um, but even beyond that, you know, let's be athletic, I mean, academic champions too, not just athletic champions. I mean, you know, to help with just playing a sport well, if we put that same energy, it takes, in my opinion, the same amount of energy to become an NFL player as it does to become a surgeon. I mean, it's, it's, it takes that much hard work. I mean, when I see these guys working, how hard they have to study, they have to study playbooks this thick, they have to work, you know, do two-a-day practices in the summertime, 100-degree heat with all these pads on. I don't know how they do it. I really don't. Um, but when I see that grind, I'm thinking about the grind that I went through to get my PhD. And I got my first job, and I didn't make as much as an NFL player, but I made – I was the highest paid employee on the Syracuse University campus, at least among all the assistant and the associate professors. Because in finance, um, I think at that time, we were starting in the six figures. And, and then my, my income went up as the years went by. And so it's great because I know that I can do this till I'm 70. Um, and now I, I get to work with the public and go give speeches and stuff like that. And I'm doing what I love. And, and this is so much better than my life would have been if I had just leveraged all of this on sports. So don't let your son just be an athlete. Let him know that he's meant to be so much more. Don't let the world define him. Tell him that he's not going to just be a football player, a basketball player. And really, like I said, due to the brain damage issue, I'm almost saying that maybe just staying away from football might be a good idea, but that's totally up to you. Well, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World. Thank you for enduring me for the last 18 minutes and two seconds. So until we meet again, please stay strong, be blessed, and be educated. I am gone. Peace.